hands up! The first installment of the Final Fantasy VII Remake is right around the corner. In not too long, we'll be experiencing a brand new Midgar and a retelling of one of the most loved video game stories of all time. Are you okay? I'm fine. So, to make sure we're all ready, I thought I'd do a little bit of a refresher, bringing us all up to speed on the story and the world of Final Fantasy VII. First off, remember the cave where- Whoa, 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 whoa. What about those of us waiting to experience Final Fantasy VII for the first time? We don't want any big spoilers. Hmm, a Final Fantasy VII spoiler-free story primer. You know what? I'll take that challenge. I'll do a spoiler filled video in good time and until then you can click up here to watch Zoe and I play the original game from scratch, but right now, buckle up nerds, sit down, shut up and drink your god tea and let's mosey. So. Final Fantasy VII's story begins in Midgar, a huge dystopian city where citizens live separated by a giant circular plate, with the rich living above and the poor living below in the slums, where they can rarely, if ever, see the sky. Picture the top layer as a giant rotting pizza, with each of its eight slices representing a different sector, and then a huge skyscraper-like structure dominating the skyline in the center. This central building is the headquarters of the Shinra Electric Power Company, formerly Shinra Manufacturing, a massive energy conglomerate that basically owns the city and a good chunk of the planet, also known as Gaia, too, after finding a way to process, refine and utilize an energy source known as Mako. In order to effectively power the metropolis of Midgar, Shinra set up several reactors that suck Mako directly from the Earth, one in each of the eight sectors or pizza slices. More on that later. <sighs> Anyone else hungry for pizza now? Just me? Nah, me too. Damn delicious looking dystopia. Anyway, Shinra's monopoly on Mako energy and its subsequent and seemingly unlimited supply of money means the company is able to expand and experiment on many different fronts, from vehicle and weapons manufacturing and space exploration all the way to genetic engineering. It sets up macro reactors in different locations across the world, and it's also able to refine and crystallize macro energy into materia, small orbs of varying colors that allow those wielding them to cast and use magic. Although materia can occur naturally in various springs found throughout Gaia, this process can take centuries. And so Shinra scientists find a way to speed up the process and mass produce materia instead. As Shinra's chokehold on the world grew stronger every day, very few people were willing or able to stand up to the increasingly corrupt company and halt its literal world domination. One exception was the proud and independent nation of Wutai. After Shinra made moves to install macro reactors in Wutai, the country rose up in retaliation, sparking a conflict known as the Wutai War, which ended with Wutai being beaten back by Shinra and becoming a shadow of its former self. Little more than a tourist destination as it quietly resolved not to anger Shinra further so as to live in relative peace. Shinra's victory in Wutai and across any other potential uprisings was easily assured thanks to its own private army, an elite fighting force known as Soldier. Of course, soldiers, the backbone of any- No, 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 Soldier. S-O-L-D-I-E-R, all caps. An acronym, so it stands for- No, it's not an acronym, it doesn't stand for anything, it's just all in caps. Because... Uh, I don't make the rules, although personally, I've always imagined it stood for super ordinary lads drafted into evil wrongdoing. Aoife Wilson, is that a silent W? Uh, no it isn't, otherwise I'd be Aoife Ilson. Anyone? Anyone, come on. Yes! Soldier members are indeed ordinary humans, for the most part, to begin with. They're split into ranks, third, second and first class, with first class soldiers being the strongest and most skilled in combat. However, all soldier members are subjected to a process in which they are physically infused with raw Mako energy, giving their eyes a distinct green glow and their bodies superhuman strength, speed and agility, with varying results. Across the world, adults and children alike are encouraged to idolize first-class soldiers and many kids grew up dreaming of one day joining soldiers' ranks. Since the unit's inception, there have been a handful of legendary first-class soldiers, the best among these being Sephiroth. 
the strongest and most famous soldier member ever known due to his prominent role in winning the Wutai War. Other first-class soldiers include Genesis Rhapsodus, a man obsessed with apples and the play Loveless, whose goal is to become as famous as Sephiroth. There's also Angeal Hewley, who prides humility and honour above all else and who takes dignity in his work, and Angeal's protégé, Zach Fair, an excitable and friendly young man from Gongaga who, like so many others who grew up dreaming of being in Soldier, wishes to prove himself a hero. After the war in Wutai, Genesis takes his resolution of eclipsing Sephiroth's fame way too far, defecting from Soldier and Shinra with a scientist named Hollander, in order to create an army of even more advanced soldiers to prove himself more powerful. Sephiroth, Angeal, and Zack set out to stop their former friend, who is eventually defeated. But during the conflict, Zack is dispatched on a mission to Midgar's Sector 5 reactor, and through a bit of serendipity and a lot of dumb luck, he meets a young girl named Aerith Gainsborough, and the two strike up a friendship. And you might want to remember that name because Aerith is rather important. I'm sure I heard someone say her name was Aerith. Well, yes and no. The original English language release of Final Fantasy VII transliterated her name differently than intended because it simply lacked the right context, resulting in her name being Eris. Every game after the fact has retconned it back to Erith, which underlines her connection to the Earth. A lot of original fans still call her Eris, though, and you know what? They're not entirely wrong. Aerith is an ancient, so? also known as a Cetra, and she's the very last of her kind. The Cetra are a race of people deeply spiritual in nature who can directly communicate with the planet and are pretty much identical to regular humans. In fact, humans are actually distant descendants of Cetra who lost their ability to speak with the planet over the millennia. The Cetra people are skilled at cultivating and encouraging life, which is possibly why flowers have no difficulty blooming wherever Aerith is. Ages past, the Cetra took on the responsibility of caring for the planet, and because of their affinity with the Earth's energy, which they called the life stream or spirit energy, they could use magic inherently. The Cetra were a nomadic people. They would travel around the planet, healing and helping the natural world to flourish, and then move on to another location. They did this in order to fulfill an ancient prophecy about a promised land, which stated that they would find and return to this mysterious and mystical place at their journey's end, a place of happiness and, it was theorized, of infinite Mako energy. Because of whispers of the Cetra legend passed down over the millennia, Shinra would devote huge amounts of time and money into attempts to find this promised land and thus harness the endless amounts of Mako energy found within. However, 2,000 years before the beginning of Final Fantasy VII, a meteorite crash-landed on the planet, causing a huge crater to appear on its northern continent. The Cetra, drawn to the site in order to heal the huge wound in the planet that the crash had caused, discovered a sentient being had travelled to Gaia on the meteorite, and it approached them initially under the guise of friendship but it ended up infecting the Cetra with a kind of virus, sapping their powers and turning them into monsters. It would then take the form of the Cetra it had destroyed in order to get close to and in turn destroy their loved ones too. The Cetra called it the Calamity from the Skies, and their civilization was almost completely wiped out trying to subdue it. The planet also autonomously worked to protect itself against the alien threat by creating beings capable of fighting it. But in one last ditch effort to stop the entity and protect all other life on the planet, it was the Cetra who were successful in sealing it away within the northern crater where it had first appeared. Unfortunately, the Cetra race was decimated in the process, and their numbers continued to dwindle until both they and the Calamity disappeared from memory and were almost completely forgotten by humans. What memories did remain passed into myths and legends, and humans forgot about their once sworn duty to protect the planet. 
2,000 years later, the Shinra Electric Power Company is in business, and business is booming. But still the corporation is looking for new and even more efficient ways to harvest Mako energy, mass-produce materia, take control of Gaia's natural resources, and thus dominate the planet. Having heard tell of the Cetra legends, seemingly pointing to an infinite supply of Mako existing within the Promised Land, Shinra siphons its resources into finding out where the Promised Land actually is. The search leads Shinra's researchers, led by a biologist named Faramis Gast, to the northern crater, where they exhume the dormant remains of the malevolent alien being that all but wiped out the Cetra. However, Gast and his two assistants, Professor Hojo and Lucretia Crescent, mistook these remains for an actual Cetra, gave it a name, and relayed their findings to Shinra. Bad idea. Shinra, believing this strange mummified corpse to be the last remnant of a long extinct race and thus its ticket to the fabled promised land, ordered its science division to find a way to use the genetic makeup found in the remains to create a brand new Cetra, someone under its control and capable of then leading Shinra to the promised land, so the company could then profit from it. It would call this new land Neo Midgar. The science division couldn't agree on one way to create this being, and so a project which actually comprised of two separate projects sprung up, with each of these competing to be the first to bear fruit. They were Project S, led by Gast and Co, and Project G, led by Dr. Hollander. Just FYI, Project G doesn't feature in the original Final Fantasy VII game, but it is a major focus of its PSP prequel, Crisis Core, which we won't go into too much detail on here because that would involve talking major spoilers and heads would roll if I told you those. Anyway, eventually, Gast discovers that the alien is not in fact a Cetra, but something else entirely, and as a fairly ethical man, he resigns from the project and attempts to find other ways of reviving the Cetra. Eventually, Shinra tracks down who they believe to be the last living Cetra, a woman named Ifalna, and Gast is assigned to interviewing slash interrogating her about the legends regarding the Promised Land. The two end up falling in love, and Gast defects from Shinra, and he and Afalna escape together, hiding out in Gast's lab in Icicle Inn. Which, confusingly, is the name of a town and not just an inn. It does have some pretty sweet snowboarding slopes, though. Professor Hojo takes over Gast's work at Shinra, but being neither as intelligent as Gast, nor as principled, he turns to rather dark methods in the pursuit of giving his superiors what they want, and covering up his shady practices after the fact. Without giving too much away, it turns out that in confusing an alien's DNA with that of a Cetra, Shinra and its scientists end up creating a whole new mess of problems. Anyway, fast forward 30 or so years, and this is where the story of Final Fantasy VII officially begins. Having crushed any potential opposition from Wutai, Shinra, in effect, rules the world, keeping ordinary people simultaneously poor and dependent on the company's technology. To deal with anyone or anything that would rise up to oppose it, Shinra creates the investigation sector of the General Affairs Department, alternatively known as the Department of Administrative Research, unofficially known as the Turks. Thanks. For when Shinra doesn't want to wield the brute force strength of its soldier army, it deploys the Turks to deal in more clandestine operations like kidnappings, espionage, and even assassination. They're also tasked with keeping tabs on high-profile persons of interest to the company, people like Aerith, who Shinra has kept watch on for a number of years with eventual plans to apprehend her. Yet, despite Shinra's power, small pockets of resistance rise up in an effort to protect the planet from the harm Shinra's dirty dealings are causing it. These groups vary in their extremism, and some even see complete and total genocide as humanity's rightful penance for the destruction it has wrought. One organization even attempts to summon a powerful creature called Zirconiade to do just that, to burn down the world and start over with a blank if scorched slate. That organization's name was Avalanche. Also in all caps, please do not ask me what the acronym is. Avalanche. No. No, no, no. This, let's call it ambitious plan, covered in the Japanese-only mobile game Before Crisis, is eventually quashed by the Turks. But a new, slightly less ruthless version of Avalanche is born soon after, led 
by one Barrett Wallace. Barrett believes that Shinra's practices are harmful, and though he doesn't want to go so far as to completely eradicate humanity, he does see some civilian casualties as a small price to pay for saving the planet. So, leading a small band of eco-terrorists, Barrett plans to bring down Shinra by first targeting its Midgar reactors. Yet, given Shinra's vast army, Avalanche lacks the muscle to pull off the plan. Tifa Lockhart, martial artist, bar owner, kicker of bad guys, amazing yeah, hair, and a fairly new recruit of Avalanche, suggests that they hire a childhood friend of hers who's recently arrived in Midgar to help. That person also happens to be a skilled mercenary and also happens to be a former member of Soldier. That friend's name is Cloud Strife. Cue hero shot. So, Cloud & Co rolling into the Sector 1 reactor of Midgar is the very first scene of the game. And that's pretty much all you need to get started. Does it all make sense? There's obviously so much more that we haven't covered, and tons of secondary stories that all feed into a greater understanding of the main plot. And even today, people still debate certain plot points and what they really mean. It'll be fun to see if and how any of it is updated with the remake. The main takeaways are that the planet needs help, hello 2020 relevance, evil company is evil, Tifa and Aerith are best girls, and there are tons of twists and turns, sorry I was still really hungry for pizza, that you just won't see coming. I just want the big sword. Hey, that's the Buster Sword Buster, and you put some respect on its name. Anyway, subscribe to stay tuned for lots more Final Fantasy VII coverage, including a spoiler-filled video coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to Eurogamer for a brand new gaming video every single day, if you're into that sort of thing. And click the bell icon to be notified when a new video goes live. Oh, I've eaten so much pizza. There ain't no getting off of this train we're on. We'll see you in Midgar.